Well, there are um, two words that I think are terribly misunderstood, almost dangerously misunderstood in our culture. And the first word is Christian, and the second word is church. Now, just briefly, some of you think this stuff is cool to think about, but uh, both of those words are nouns, right? We're in agreement on that. The first is the individual follower of Jesus, and the second is the collective group of the followers of Jesus. And yet, I think we oftentimes come up short as Christians in the church, and we forget this very simple thing, that nouns need verbs, right? And noun nouns actually need verbs. Christians and the church, without verbs, um, don't have a lot of meaning, they don't have a lot of significance, and we really don't have a whole lot of purpose. And so, when I put this sentence up here for you, I want you to look at this and I want you to think about how you fill in this particular blank, right? Christians blank. What comes to your mind when you think about what goes in that blank? And I would just say it maybe largely depends on, on who you are and maybe what some of your experiences may have been throughout your life. And let me just try to illustrate this with two stories that I've heard recently. I've been doing some different reading about um, expeditions to the top of Mount Everest. And I think it's pretty cool to learn that 4,000 people have actually made it to the summit of Everest. Uh, on the other side of that, almost 300 people have actually died trying to scale Everest at the same time. And so when you talk to experienced climbers, they say the thing that is a threat to most people actually making it to the top and back down again is not necessarily um, the weather. It's not running out of food or water. It's not uh, anything like altitude. It's not elevation, exhaustion, none of those things. They actually say the threat to making it to the top and down again is actually other climbers. And so an engineer from Cleveland I was reading about had actually reached the top of the summit and on his way back down again, he ran out of oxygen. And 40 different climbers actually passed him on their way to the top, and not a single one of them actually stopped to help him, and he actually died on the mountain. Another climber, a guy by the name of Ed Vistiers, makes this observation. He says, passing people who are dying is not uncommon. Unfortunately, there are those who say, it's not my problem. I've spent all this money, and I'm going to the summit. And now there would be some people that I know, and they, maybe some of you all, if you're really honest, who would say, well, that right there is a picture of Christians at times. Right? We lock eyes with people, and we pass people, and they have needs, and we do this every day, and they're just kind of looking for another breath, and another chance, and another opportunity, and another moment. And, and we have a tendency to maybe look away or maybe even ignore altogether an opportunity to help someone. And you know, uh, as a matter of fact, a, a survey a few years ago, uh, probably about 15 years ago, of young adults who are ages 16 to 29, they filled in this blank right here, right? Christians blank. And what they said, the most uh, popular answers, top six answers to what they gave when they think of the word Christian were this. Christians are hypocrites, or Christians see people as projects. Christians are homophobic, sheltered, political, and judgmental. So as you look at this sentence again, Christians blank, especially if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, what do you want to be in there, right? I mean, what do you want it to say? I, I know what I want to be in there. And that's the second story. And this actually happened uh, a year ago, actually this coming week, a year ago, maybe you remember this, uh, last time, a uh, year in Panama Beach, two boys who had gotten on boogie boards and had gone out into the water, and they ended up getting caught up in a riptide. And a few people, including their family members, initially responded and got into the water, and then they got caught up into this riptide as well. And there was no lifeguard present, no rescue services available, and a woman by the name of Jessica Simmons saw what was happening, and she's a strong swimmer, so she jumped into the water, and she started making her way out there. Well, while she's doing that, other people on the beach started forming this human chain, and here's actually a, a, a picture of that when that took place last year. And it was a couple of people on the beach, and then a few other people began making their way into the water, and it's, first it's five people, and then it's five more people, and eventually Jessica and her husband, Derek, reached these nine people who are way out here in the water, and it took about an hour for them to do this, but all of them eventually made it safely back to land. And as you look at this picture, there's actually almost 
80 different people who are involved in this human chain. And I love what she said when I talked to her later. This was her quote about the whole thing. She said, these people are not drowning today. It's not happening. We're going to get them out. And one of the things I love about this particular story, as I was thinking back on it, is I doubt the people that are part of this human chain actually stopped and asked a certain set of questions. I'm guessing none of these people jumped into action, actually stood on the beach and actually said, well, wait a second, who are these people, right? Uh, what color are these people? Or where are these people actually from? I don't think anybody ever sat back and said, you know, I wonder if they would help me if I was the person who was out there in the water. These people, they just actually moved to action. And I remember reading about this and thinking, you know, God, I want that picture to be the story of my life. I want that picture that's summarized there to be the story of our churches. I, I want that to be the thing that helps fill in this particular blank. So it reads this way, Christians love. Right, Christians love. And if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, I'm going to read a section from 1 John chapter 4. You have a phone, you can open it up. Otherwise, I want to put all of those <coughs> scriptures up here on the screen. But there is um, one writer in the Bible who talked about love more than anybody else, and that's a guy by the name of John. John saw it modeled. He heard it taught. He actually received it firsthand from Jesus. John actually gets referred to at times as the disciple who Jesus loved, and that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't love the other disciples. It just means he and John had this special relationship. John wrote uh, five books of the Bible, creatively titled John. First John, Second John, and Third John, and then one that was very interesting called Revelation. And we're going to read from First John, uh, where he uses the word, and it's really central to what he's talking about. He uses it 44 times in his writing, and in chapter 4 alone, where we're going to read, he mentions love 27 times. So John thinks it's pretty important, and I want you to see what he says about love. Here's what he says. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, let me catch up. Here we go. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And I just want to simply cover what I think John talks about here in what we would say might be three truths. All right, Three truths that I think we're going to grasp if we're ever going to grow in our love for people. All right. And if you're a note taker, here's the first one, very simple. God is love. And this one's pretty short. I think it's to the point. John covers it well. He says, think about this. When given a chance to describe God, and he could have chosen to do this any way that he wanted to, John says more than once, here's God. God is love. In other words, God's the very definition of love. I mean, we could say that God is described by his love, but it's not even really that love is defining God, John's saying. Look, God is actually defining love. And so while love is definitely something God does, he, he hits that very hard, it's also, John says, who he is. So don't miss that. When God does anything, then, he's love in action. That, that's just the first truth, right? If you ever want to know what God looks like, right, look to God. He defines love. So that's truth number one. God is love. But here's the second thing, I think, if you're kind of a note taker or you want to grasp this. This is a progression that John's leading us on. Truth two is God loves us. Right? God loves us. He loves you. He, he loves me. He loves everyone around you. And listen to how amazing this is in verse 9 and 10. We just read this, but listen to this again. God loves us, he says, by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And here's the amazing thing about that. When you just kind of step back and read what John's really saying here is that God loves us so much. God loves you so much that he did all of these things that we just read about before we ever thought about doing anything in response to that. 
He loves us not because we deserve it, but because it's who he is and what he does. So I, I love what John's driving at here, right? That God not only loves you that way, he loves me that way. God loves every other person in the same way. And it just doesn't get much better than that, does it? That God loves you. God loves me and God loves everyone around you, meaning that there's no one that God does not love. That there's actually no one that God sent Jesus to die for. There's no one that God does not desire to have a relationship with. As a matter of fact, if you have ever been um, in church before, as a matter of fact, you probably didn't have to be in church before. You probably know that this sounds a lot like something else that John wrote that you might be familiar with, which says this. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And I think if you have been in church much of your life, it's easy for us sometimes to forget this very, very simple truth. That what's amazing about God's love for people is that he offers his love to us before he even knows how we're going to respond to it. Right? In other words, he doesn't withhold love from us until we prove that we deserve it. His love's not dependent on what we do or what we don't do. He just loves. And what John says is, in both of these places, that God offers that love to who? The world. He offers it to the world. And I, I, I've spent some time just thinking about how easy it is to lose sight of what might be encompassed by the word the world. I think it's easy to read that and go, oh, the world. Yeah, God loves the world. He loves everybody. And it's easy to lose sight of maybe the names and faces and the stories and the real people behind that word, world. So I did an exercise uh, recently. It took me about 20 minutes. And I think this would be a great next step for you guys when you leave here today to go, you know what, I I'm going to do that too. And it's just a good reminder for me to be reminded, not only does God love the world, but who are the people that make up the world? So what the exercise was is, I just kind of, and again, it took me about 20 minutes. I, I worked through the alphabet from A to Z. I just start making a list of who are the different people that God loves. So I, I, I'm going to share some of it with you. Maybe it will inspire you to do this as well, all right? God loves air traffic controllers, astrologers, addicts, the Amish, and acrobats. So you're going to see how it works, right? You can make your own list. British Batman, banjo players, beekeepers, bookkeepers. God loves cab drivers, crooks, Chinese, chefs, and car dealers. Daycare workers, dental hygienists, doctors, dairy farmers, and drag queens. So you kind of get a feel for how it works, right? And you can make your own list and go, oh, that makes it real, doesn't it? And some of you are like, are you going to read the whole list? I'm going to read the whole list. All right, so here we go. God loves elephant trainers, endocrinologists, Ethiopians, ESPN reporters, and English teachers. God loves football players, both kinds. Frat brothers, the French, florists, and people who wear flannel. You have to get creative at times, all right? God loves gang members, Germans, governors, golfers, and goofballs, hairdressers, home builders, heterosexuals, homosexuals, and hunters. God loves ice cream truck drivers, the Irish, IT specialists, and immigrants. He loves jewelers, jewelry three, thieves, judges, Jews, and the Japanese. And it rhymes, and that's completely unintentional. God loves kings, kitchen staff, knitters, Luke Keekley and Coach K. It's true, he loves Coach K. Limousine drivers, lemonade stand workers, landscapers, lawyers and librarians. God loves meter maids, mailmen, massage therapists, money launderers, and meteorologists. Nannies, nurses, nursery workers, neurosurgeons, and nut jobs. Are you getting inspired to maybe make a list? I hope so. God loves optometrists, office managers, orthopedic surgeons, outdoorsmen, and people from Omen. Policemen, principals, painters, pedophiles, and pawnbrokers. God loves quiz masters, queens, the band queen. Queers and people from Qatar or Qatar, or however you want to say it. He, got, he, he loves runners, receptionists, rapists, race car drivers, and even, this was really hard to write down, Roy Williams. God loves surfers, secretaries, salesmen, shoplifters, and sheep herders. Teachers, tattoo artists, travel agents, tax accountants, tax evaders. Utility workers, you have to start getting creative to get to the end of the alphabet. Uber drivers, the unemployed, Ugandans, and umbrella makers. God loves vegans, veterinarians, video gamers, vice presidents, and Venezuelans. God loves waitresses, writers, webmasters, welders, and weird people. Xylophone players, Xerox repairmen, people named Xavier, Xena, Warrior Princess, and the X-Men, all of them, all right? God loves youth pastors, yak owners, 
YMCA workers, yo-yo champions, yodelers, and finally, God loves zookeepers, people from Zambia, people from Zimbabwe, and people preparing for the zombie apocalypse. That's my list, okay? Woo! God, God loves, here's the point, everyone, right? He loves you, and he loves me. And all of those things set the stage for what I hope you'll walk out of here with is the next step today is this, is that truth three. We love God by loving other people. Like we, we love God by loving others. Jesus said the two greatest commandments were this, right? Number one, love God, followed closely by number two, love other people. And John does something amazing here in chapter four. He joins those two things together in one thought when he writes this in verse 11. He says, dear friends, since God loved us that much, Right? He's looking back to God loved you when you didn't deserve it. God loved you before you responded. God loved you by sending Jesus. Since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Now, he's saying that the response to how God loves us is what? To love people. And I'll be honest with you, that's just not as easy as it sounds, is it? <laughs> because so oftentimes, I think our love comes with what we would call maybe qualifiers of sorts, Right? And I don't know if you've ever used any of these before or not, or thought these, I know I have, where you say, okay, well, I, I will love you if, right? There's an if condition. I love you if you do what I want. I love you if you make the team, or if you get the grades, or if you're my friend. Or how about the win one, right? I love you when. I love you when you get yourself together, or when you make more money, or when you're actually lovable. Or some of them have used this one, right, the because, right? I'll love you because, because you're worthy or because you got the trophy or because you're like me. And on a personal note, I, you know, I'm ashamed to admit that I've done this before where I've made up the rules, right? I made up the rules on, on who and how I give love. And there are things, right, that really get put to the test at times when you start to say, all right, what would it actually look like for me to love people that I don't even like? Or what would it actually look like to decide to love someone that I don't want to love or who's not like me at all? Someone who may not actually deserve to be loved. Maybe these words attributed to C.S. Lewis will ring true for you. He says this, there's someone I love even though I don't approve of what he does. There's someone I accept though some of his thoughts and actions revolt me. There's someone I forgive, even though he hurts the people I love the most. That someone is me. There are plenty of things I do that I don't like, but if I could love myself without approving of all I do, I could also love others without approving of all they do. As that truth has been absorbed into my life, it's changed the way I view everyone. Hey, how many of you know that only God can actually produce this kind of love in you? Only God can do that. And I just want to go back and grab verse 8 because I think it really ties together so beautifully these three truths that John talks about. He writes this. Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? I mean, anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And when you think about this, right, there, there's a lot of different ways that we try to Measure our standing with God. You know what I'm saying? Like performance and things like that. But John says, Here, here's one, right? That if you don't love people, you don't know God. In other words, you can't say that you love God and then turn around and not actually love other people. And so I, I'm looking at this and I was thinking, you know, I thought, well, what if we actually added a blank after the word love, the first word love there? If we actually added a blank right there, so it, I bet that would really help drive home the point of things. So it actually read this way. Anyone who does not love, blank, and you fill in the blank, does not know God. Anyone who does not love a neighbor, right? a boss, spouse, a race, a religion, HOA board member, that's the one I had to put in there. Right? <laughs> Anyone who does not love, blank, does not know God. Now, that makes the driving question, okay, for this message pretty simple and yet very, very personal, okay? And we'll, we'll land the whole thing here. Uh, now, the driving question is really simple. It's this, who do I need to love? Right? Who do I need to love? 
Uh, some of us might be thinking, and, I, and I'm with you on this one, if only I had a free space, right? An exemption of some sorts. If I could, if I could get one pass and it wouldn't count against me, then who, who's that person, right? Because maybe you have somebody in mind. Well, one person you could be exempt from loving. It could be a group, it could be an individual, it could be somebody sitting near you, don't point at them, but it could be the case. But, and whoever it is that you're thinking of, that just might be the name of the person that belongs in that blank right there for you. So now practically, right? Let's think about how we're going to do this. If, if we're going to love people well, then we have to understand that love begins with being available and aware. So let me introduce you to this woman here. Her, her name's Kristen Schell. She recently wrote a book about her experiences. You can find it fairly easily. She was tired of seeing her neighbors come home at the end of the day, pull into their garage, shut the door, disappear into their house, and never see them again. And she had been planning an outdoor party that she was going to host in her backyard for, I think, one of her kids' birthdays. And she had ordered this picnic from Lowe's. And she had it delivered to her house, and they had orders to take it to the backyard. When they get there, they can't get through the back gate. So she comes out and greets them, and they say, where would you like us to put this, help us get in the backyard? And as she's standing there thinking about it, she has this idea. She said, what if we took all of our backyard activities and we actually put them in the front yard? So they left the table sitting in her front yard. She went out, bought a can of turquoise paint, covered the table, left it in the front yard. And eventually, one neighbor came over and sat at the picnic table, and then another, and before long, she was meeting all kinds of people in her neighborhood who would simply come by and ask, why do you have a turquoise table in your front yard? And she would say, to meet people like you. And they start sitting down and opening up their lives, and she now hosts what she calls Front Yard Fridays with her neighbors and regularly has 30 people who are gathered around her picnic table, as many as 75 or more people who will show up for these special uh, seasonal gatherings. And the idea seems to be catching on. She started a whole website, she wrote a book, she's done all this stuff, and by latest count, there's more than a thousand turquoise tables popping up in places around the United States and even in other countries. And she just simply says, no one seems to have time anymore. We're losing the art of communication, and we're always in a rush. Well, in spite of um, what I would say are probably some of my own uh, parenting failures in this area, all three of my kids have learned somewhere along the line to love other people and to do it really well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this week they're all in different places, uh, camps, hanging out with and loving middle school or high school students. Uh, my youngest, um, Desiree, who's a student at North Carolina State, uh, recently developed a friendship with a young girl. She's a 20-year-old African-American. She had previously been homeless before they met, and some people at downtown church in Raleigh had helped her get into an apartment. And now Desiree and a couple of her friends have come along and, and kind of jumped in. And so they routinely stop by to see her at her apartment. You know, do you have what you need? Just checking on her. They might stay for a while and uh, watch a movie with her. And they've helped her fill out job applications and coached her on some basic life skills. And a couple months back, they decided they wanted to teach her how to make a few meals for herself. She didn't know how to, know how to cook. And so they took her out. Um, shopping, showed her how to make some food, brought her over to our house, and we just sat at the table and we ate together. And when they're done, they sat on the couch and they helped her prepare for an upcoming job interview and just just um, helping just kind of coach her on how she's going to answer certain questions. And I'm able to watch this um, from the dining room as they're sitting in the living room, and not only is that a proud dad moment for me, I'm inspired to love better when I see other people who are loving well. Now, I don't know who it's going to be for you. I, I don't know how it's going to look for you. Here, here's what I know. I just think about what's happening in our world and just even some of the people I know and, and even what happens sometimes in my own heart. Here's what I know. I know we can do better. Right? I, I know we can do better. And there are opportunities to love all around us, maybe even next to us today. It, it's people who are going through a loss, right? It could be divorce. It could be addiction. It could be a struggle. There are people who are just simply alone, and we know this already, right? We know that everyone has pain in their life. Everyone needs a hand. Everyone needs someone to listen to them because that's a language that we all share. We have that in common. And so here's my prayer for us, right? For me, how about that? 
Let's not be the ones, referring to my opening stories, who are knocking people down and passing them by. Let's be the ones who are wading deep and picking people up. Now, I want you to seal some next steps for yourself today, okay? And you were given a program when you came in. If you want to have a pen, I, I want to challenge you to write something down in answer to these two questions. So make a note on your phone, whatever it is. No, you're not going to hand us in. No one's going to see it. Just take it with you. Maybe even put it in a place where you can be reminded of these. And here's the two questions. You've been staring at this one for a while. Who? Right? It's a who question. Who do I need to love? And who's God bringing to my mind today? And secondly is this, how? Like, how am I going to do that? How will I love them? Now, before you start writing or anything, uh, think about this. You know, Jesus changed the world with 12 followers. Right? He taught them, he trained them, he sent them out. Jesus trained the world with 12 followers. Just imagine for a minute what you could do with the 100 plus people who are part of this church. Or imagine about the thousands of people who live in the triad who are part of churches. If there were people who didn't just want to receive love, who also wanted to give it. And what if when people were asked to describe us, right? What, what if when people were asked to describe they didn't hesitate. They just simply said, oh, he, he loves, right? Or, or she loves, or they love. That, that church loves. And you know what happens is as we love people the way, even maybe part of the way, that God loves us. Not only are we changing lives, we're introducing them to the kind of love that God desires to give them to. And so I'm just going to wrap up with a prayer this morning, just asking God to produce this kind of love in us more and more, to help us love people the way that God loves them and the way that he loves us. But I just want to throw out um, just a couple of quick thoughts before we wrap it up. Maybe it is that you came in here today and you just simply need to know that God is defined by love. Right? God's defined by his love. He's not defined by his anger or his wrath. He, he's defined, John says, by his love. And maybe you just need to hear that today, that God loves you. I mean, the world, that, that's great, but you, God loves you. Specifically you. And maybe you've never responded to that today. I, I would love to talk with you about that more. How God demonstrated that through Jesus. I know um, the guys here, I would love to talk with you about that as well. But I think there's probably just a large group of us who need to grow in our love for other people. So I just want to be diligent today to ask God to produce more and more love in our lives.